Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. Uh, in this presentation, I will discuss uh, different types of uh, probabilistic and uh, dimensionality uh, reduction techniques to remove uh, motion artifacts from the measurements of a wireless uh, electrocardiogram. Uh, uh, there are uh, at least three devices, medical devices, uh, which are uh, highly relevant to measure electrical uh, potentials uh, produced by um, excitable cells in the body. Uh, excitable cells are nerve cells, uh, tissue cells, and uh, muscle cells. The devices I'm uh, talking about are uh, electroencephalography, EEG, electrocardiogram, and electromyogram. <coughs> EEG measures the uh, uh, electrical activities of the brain. Uh, ECG measures the electrical activities exciting the human heart. And uh, EMG measures the electrical activities produced by the activities of the muscles. For the review process, uh, we will uh, limit our uh, discussion to uh, electrocardiogram. There, there is a long list of applications uh, which can uh, make use of uh, electrocardiogram. Well, with electrocardiogram, we can measure, uh, we can uh, diagnose the uh, health of the heart in associated uh, problems. We can also diagnose epilepsy, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, and so on. Often, the, uh, when the electrocardiogram measurements are taken, the patient will be at a resting state, either sitting or uh, lying uh, down on a couch or on a bed. This is because the electrodes which uh, measure the potential difference between two uh, places in the upper body um, should not be subject to movement. Otherwise, when the electrodes move, then the underlying electrolytic uh, structure will be disturbed and this produces its own electrical potential uh, which can be mistaken for electric, uh, electrical potential arising from the activities of the heart. And uh, this might lead to uh, a false diagnosis. But on the other hand, using wireless electrocardiograms can be very useful uh, because uh, now the subject can be free, uh, it exists freely, and the heart responds to this uh, exertion. And then it is possible to diagnose the heart in its true uh, condition, in its true underlying uh, nature. But the problem is that with movement, as you can see here, uh, we can observe different types of uh, distortion arising from the uh, motion artifact, both long-term and uh, short-term uh, distortions. The long-term distortion, which you can see in the right picture can easily be corrected using uh, some electrical uh, or digital uh, filters such as uh, high pass filters uh, because the the drift is a gradual change in the baseline and this has uh, low frequencies so it is not uh, a problem what's a problem is the uh, localized uh, change in the uh, waves uh, and the frequency of this localized changes overlaps with the frequency of the electrocardiogram. So by simply applying uh, digital filters, it is not possible to uh, remove them. So there are different types of uh, approach to uh, remove uh, motion uh, artifacts. It has its own uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages, but most importantly, uh, it has its own set of uh, assumptions to produce a meaningful uh, 
uh, outcome. So today we're going to discuss uh, this uh, approach and uh, when they are um, useful and when it is difficult to justify their use. For this analysis, uh, we use uh, motion sensors because, as I told you, motion artifacts are results of uh, human motion, and this motion disturbs the setup of the um, electrodes used to measure potential differences. So the uh, um, uh, argument is that if we use motion sensors, if we attach motion, motion sensors near the electrodes, uh, can we measure the motion affecting the electrodes? And if it's possible to uh, measure the, the motions, for example, using uh, three-dimensional accelerometer sensors, uh, tilt sensors, uh, impedance sensors, or gyroscope for that matter, is it possible to correlate this data with the electrocardiogram signal and use this to identify the uh, motion artifact and uh, remove them. <coughs> Excuse me. So th uh, this can be answered in affirmative because if the motion sensors are highly sensitive enough, they should be able to pick up the motion disturbing the electrodes. And this uh, signal should be correlated with the underlying motion artifact. So if somehow we can establish this correlation, we can subtract the motion artifacts using this signal from the useful signal. For the analysis of the, this uh, different approach, we uh, consider different types of uh, motions. We measured a large, um, uh, we took a large amount of measurement from 11 uh, healthy subjects working at the university between the age of 25 and 35. These motions, not all of them are listed here, but the, the, the most important motions are uh, cycling, climbing up and down a staircase, jumping, uh, doing push up, skipping, and uh, running. Uh, and then using this uh, signal, uh, these different types of uh, movement, we uh, analyzed the scope and usefulness of the different types of. Uh, artifact removing uh, techniques, and I'll give you a brief overview of uh, this. <laughs> in, uh, in a clinical setting, uh, doctors usually uh, segment the um, time series of an electrocardiogram into heartbeats. A heartbeat consists of uh, the following important uh, wave complexes. So we have the P wave, uh, which is related to the uh, activities of the atrium, collecting uh, temporarily blood in the upper chamber of the heart. Then we have the QRS complex, which is related to the ventricular activities when blood is pumped into the brain or into the, you know, into the lung and as well as the rest of the body. And we have the T wave corresponding to the uh, 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 repolarization of the, the ventricles or uh, plainly speaking, uh, corresponding to the relaxation of the, the, the ventricles. And then we have the segment, the, the, the quiet segments between these waves. The quiet segment simply means uh, when there is no uh, uh, cardiac activity. Um, so this uh, refers to the, the segment between the P wave and the QRS wave, the segment between the QRS wave and the T wave, uh, and the segments between the T wave and the P wave. So here you see this, this big area corresponds to the T wave, which comes as a result of the relaxation of the uh, ventricles. Uh, this area corresponds to the P wave, which is related to the uh, activities of the atrium. Uh, and this corresponds to the QRS uh, wave complexes corresponding to the uh, ventricular activities. All of these waves are very important to diagnose the uh, card activities, but the most important is of course the QRS complex because if blood is not pumped into the body as well as the brain and the lungs, 
uh, then the, the heart is not really functioning uh, properly. So the patient has to be taken to an emergency station as soon as uh, possible. Uh, but in order to make sure that the cardiac problems are consistent uh, problem, uh, doctors usually uh, take a look, a closer look into uh, up to 10 seconds of uh, measurement. If within this 10 seconds of measurement, the, the problem persists, then we can say that this is indeed a cardiac problem. Otherwise, uh, the problems are uh, transient, uh, one doesn't need to worry about. As you can see here, we have uh, overlapped uh, certain heartbeats of uh, a, a subject. Uh, this uh, corresponds to 10 seconds of uh, measurement. And from the uh, look, we can conclude that indeed motion artifacts affect the uh, heartbeats. The one of the most frequently used approach is the independent component analysis. The independent component analysis assumes that uh, signals are mixed linearly, uh, and these signals are independent from one another. And if we know the uh, statistical distribution, the, the PDF of these uh, source signals, it's possible to uh, separate them. So for example, here we have two input signal, I1 and I2, I refers to input, and here we have two output uh, signals. So this input signal are independent from one another. For our case, for example, this could be the clean uh, ECG produced by the activities of the heart, and this one could be the, uh, electro, the uh, motion artifacts produced by the the involuntary movement or vibration of the electrodes. Uh, of course, these are independent, so this uh, is justified. And the two signals are mixed here. So, the, for example, if you use electrocardiogram, the electrocardiogram measures both the artifact and the useful signal. So we can find in the electrocardiogram the uh, mixed signal. If we use accelerometer sensors, the accelerometer sensor measures the useful signal because the useful signal, remember, uh, induces the heart to activity and this activity manifests itself in the form of movement. So it could, the accelerometer uh, measures also the useful signal and the signal coming from the involuntary movement of the, the signal. So here we have two independent uh, output signals. We can analyze the statistics of this signal. We can plot the uh, PDF of these signals to see what type of distribution they, they have. Uh, but if we know implicitly, at least in a, in a statistic uh, sense, the, the distribution of I1 and I2, then it is possible to use uh, some statistical estimation techniques such as maximum likelihood uh, approach to separate this and then we get the estimation of I1 and uh, I2. So this is the uh, main uh, idea behind uh, independent component analysis. But uh, independent component analysis makes some uh, important uh, assumptions. The first one is that at least one of this should not have a normal distribution. The reason is that if we mix two signals, regardless of what type of distribution they have, mostly the outcome will be a normal distribution. This follows uh, from the, uh, the fact that uh, the, the addition of uh, independent uh, signal, this is uh, uh, stated by the central limit theorem, uh, often yields uh, a normal distribution. But if you mix two normal distributions, two signals, independent signal with normal distribution, both of them have a normal distribution, to separate them will be very difficult. Uh, but if one of them is a non-normal distribution, then it is possible uh, to separate them. So this is one of the uh, most important assumptions of the independent component analysis. So we considered if we, for example, take all 
these are the 13 uh, signal amounting the uh, 10 second uh, measurement. And if we say that each sample of a heartbeat is co uh, correlated with the sample of the next heartbeat and the next heartbeat, and if we see how they are statistically distributed, uh, we see that all of them are normal distributed. For example, if we just take the, this sample, uh, remember that the, the heartbeat is uh, if, uh, an event that repeats itself. This is how the, the heart beats. So that there is a strict sequential behavior in the way the heart beats. And this sequential behavior should repeat themselves at a regular interval. And if we take just one sample corresponding to a particular event and uh, observe it for 10 seconds and see the, the distribution, uh, we see that there is a normal distribution. This is because the heart does not beat uh, with exact strict or fixed intervals. There is some randomness in the way the, the heart beats. So the samples are not uh, similar. So if we plot the, the, the distribution, these are the three different samples. Uh, they are normal distributed. distributed. If on the other hand, we take also the, 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 the distribution of the corresponding uh, motion signals. Uh, you know, if we take this uh, electrocardiogram, we synchronously measure also the movement uh, sensor, uh, the movement signal coming from the accelerometer sensor. And then, if we plot, this is also the the output of the motion sensors. So both of them indicate that the outputs O1 and O2 here have normal distributions. This is okay because the central limit theorem says that if you mix independent signals, no matter what type of distribution they have, they should have normally normal distribution. And uh, this is justified. The problem is that if we take now, in the absence of any motion sensor, if we take the same samples of different heartbeats under ideal conditions, this is what we get. That means they are the, the output, at least one of the output here, the, the electrocardiogram taken under idealized condition, it also has normal distribution. And this motion sensor, we don't know because the motion data changes when the motion changes. So we don't have any reference signal. So in the absence of this reference signal, it is impossible to justify that I2 is non-Gaussian. So this is the difficulty or the limitation of independent component analysis. It's not possible to justify that one of the two signals, either I1 or I2, should have a non-Gaussian or a non-normal distribution. This cannot be justified. And uh, uh, despite the difficulty to justify, uh, most existing approach use independent uh, component analysis by assuming some type of uh, distribution, for example, uniform distribution. Most approach in EEG analysis, in ECG analysis, and in electro uh, myogram analysis uh, propose the use of independent component analysis, but we don't, we ca cannot justify this uh, by simply looking some experimental data. They, they don't confirm this assumption. Another important approach is the adaptive filter. In an adaptive filter, the idea is this, you see, is the corrupted uh, electrocardiogram signal. Uh, motion artifacts are included uh, in it. Uh, he, this one is the signal we took using uh, motion sensors. And our assumption is that the noise included in this signal is correlated with the uh, measurements of the uh, accelerometer sensor or uh, any motion sensor for that matter, gyroscope included. So adaptive filter says if in the noise should also be correlated with each other because the human body does not change instantly. It takes some, some, some time. And as a result of this slowness in change, uh, 
there has to be some correlation or autocorrelation uh, of the, the signal. So if we take samples, some past samples, N samples from the motion sensor, we can use adaptive filter to estimate the noise affecting the signal at this point. So the idea is the following. Here we have the useful measurement, the measurement. Here noise enters into the measurement uh, by way of motion artifacts. So what we record at the um, electrocardiogram is uh, a corrupted signal or a, a modified signal. If somehow we approximate this noise using a uh, motion sensor, uh, then we can subtract N from R to get this M. So this is the main idea of adaptive filter. For that, we have to feed back the estimated M into a, uh, an estimation or into the adaptive filter. The adaptive filter has two main components. The first one is uh, a, a simple uh, FIR filter, a finite impulse response uh, filter. And because this finite impulse response uh, filter takes in samples to estimate the, the, the noise, but not all of them have equal relevance. That means we have to attach a weight to each of them according to their relationship with the, with the noise. So here a weight is uh, calculated based on the observation and uh, the correlation between the observation and the signal. And this weight will be fed into the adaptive filter. The adaptive filter estimates the noise and the noise will be re reduced from the signal. This is how uh, it works. And it uses a minimum mean square estimation to estimate the, the, the different alphas or the, the weight. So here, for example, we assume using N samples, this U uh, corresponds to the uh, inertial sensor or inertial samples, and they have different uh, weights. And the, the difference between the estimated signal and the, the, the noise, we estimate it as error. And the, the goal is to minimize the square of this error in a minimum uh, mean square sense. So here we have to minimize this error. We minimize this by uh, calculating the optimum samples. Uh, or the, the, the optimum weight, and that means we have to differentiate this uh, minimum uh, mean square error with respect to the uh, each alphas and set to this set it to zero, and the value we get for the alphas will be defined so that we can express it like this. Uh, if you uh, substitute this into n hat, and then differentiate the square with respect to alpha because alphas are already here. What we get is this one. So here we have for one of the alphas, for example, for alpha one, this is what we get. That means the, the sensor signal from channel J here has to uh, be directly correlated or there has to be some cross correlation between them and the signal should also have some correlation uh, with each other this signals here you see this the, the, these figures we have because we have already taken data if we take for example three-dimensional accelerometer sensor we have data from the, uh, the x-axis the y-axis and the z-axis we have the electrocardiogram so these are the, the, the signals and the, the correlation between the different sensors can be uh, measured. But we don't have this signal. So that means because the motion, the motion artifacts embedded in the electrocardiogram, they cannot really be directly tested or directly be captured. So we, in the absence of these signals, it's impossible to uh, evaluate the, the to evaluate the existence of cross correlation between the motion artifact and the, the motion sensor. But approximation can be made. In the literature, what we do is we evaluate the, the, the correlation between, instead of N, we evaluate the correlation between 
the uh, recorded uh, electrocardiogram signal in the x-axis of the accelerometer, for example. So this is possible because we have the signal coming from the electrocardiogram, we have the signal coming from the x, the y, and the z-axis of the accelerometer, and then we can check whether they are correlated or not. And if we have this uh, data, it's possible to extract the signal uh, from the, the approximated signal from the uh, useful signal so that we can separate the noise from the useful signal. So the adaptive filter is a linear approximation. Uh, the alphas can be estimated using this expression. This is the correlation of the sensor with one another. And this is the correlation of the uh, sensors with the electrocardiogram uh, signal. As a result, we can get the alpha one. If we get the alpha one, we can express now the, uh, the, the noise uh, like this, and then we can remove it from the uh, electrocardiogram. So if you see, this is the, the, the red one is the uh, ECG signal we, we measured. And this one is the noise signal now we approximated. So it, we can now subtract the uh, blue from the red to get the useful uh, signal. Uh, adaptive filter is again highly, uh, widely used and produces some uh, reproducible uh, results. But again, our approach is indirect instead of uh, direct. Another approximation is the singular value decomposition. In singular value decomposition, we express the measurement as a matrix. That means these are the samples, for example, from uh, ECG signal. Uh, this can be the samples from uh, accelerometer sensors. Uh, in as much as we have uh, different channels of uh, motion sensors, we can establish uh, different types of uh, raw matrix. In a singular value decomposition, any matrix of any size, any dimension, can be decomposed into three basic, basic uh, uh, matrices. The idea being uh, we can take advantage of the correlation between the samples, the correlation along the uh, columns as well as uh, the, the rows, we can take advantage of this to extract some meaningful uh, factors or hidden basic factors which are non-overlapping and uh, independent. So here, the diagonal metric tells you how many independent factors there are. The U metric tells you how the, the, the rows are correlated. And the V metric tells you how the, how the uh, columns are correlated. In our assumption, since the electrocardiogram signal is not correlated with the motion artifact, by using the singular value decomposition, we can decompose the useful signal from the uh, motion artifact signal. So here, the idea is the, the original uh, matrix can be ex now reproduced by multiplying or using um, uh, outer product of the, the different colors and add them. So for example, here we have alpha one one times this uh, rows multiplied by this column plus these rows multiplied by this column plus and so on. So it can be described like this. So the main idea being independent components can be uh, separated just by looking into the raw data without making any assumptions. So the signal which are correlated will be put on one side and the signal which are not correlated will be put on the other side. So here is what we have for uh, uh, the, our, our case. Uh, we have uh, three accelerometer sensors, three uh, uh, gyroscope sensors, and three ECG outputs. And we put them at, uh, at the metrics we did a singular value decomposition and then we study factor by factor. So the most important thing is here you can see this one is a clean ECG signal. So the uh, singular value decomposition naturally separates the ECG signal from all the other signal and all the other signal we can consider as noise. We don't care from where this noise comes. 
So this is one of the uh, advantages of uh, singular value decomposition. But the only problem with singular value decomposition is that it's two dimensional. So th that means we have to study bit by bit. For example, for one heartbeat, we have a two dimensional uh, signal. One heartbeat, the, the samples uh, constitute one of the uh, dimension and the different channels or the different sources constitute another uh, dimension. But as I told you in the beginning, usually doctors take multiple samples into account to make sure that the signal is really consistent. We can also take advantage of spectral uh, properties to add additional information and make the analysis uh, robust. Uh, singular value decomposition does not help us with this. So what we have is a tensor decomposition. So we can use a tensor decomposition. A tensor decomposition can be any dimensional. It's more complex, unlike a singular value decomposition, but can result a reliable uh, output. So here, for example, we have a three-way tensor or a three-dimensional uh, array. The, uh, this can uh, represent the, the bits, the different bits. This can represent the, the, the samples. And this can represent now the different channels. So channels means x-axis accelerometer, y-axis accelerometer, z-axis accelerometer, x-axis gyroscope, and so on, as well as the uh, ECG. And then the tensor decomposition examine the existence of correlation between these uh, uh, inputs and se separate them into three different matrices. This one tells you the relationship between this axis and the hidden factors. This one tells you the relationship between this axis and the hidden factors. And this one tells you the relationship between this axis and the hidden uh, factors. And what we get are three independent views, one for A, one for B, and one for C. For our case, one for the, uh, the, the, the uh, channels, one for the heartbeats, and one for the samples. We can examine the problem from three independent uh, views. Again, the, uh, this one is really, really highly robust. Here you can see that this is the ECG signal, a clean ECG signal with T wave. Uh, P wave is hidden because when the uh, human moves, usually the P wave is uh, hidden, even in the absence of any uh, motion artifacts. Here you can see the uh, uh, QRS wave complex, the signal is somehow flipped, but we don't care about that one. And here tells you which of the, the uh, channels produce this type of consistent output. For our case, these three are uh, taken from the three ECG leads. And this can also tell you exactly where the uh, clean heartbeats can be uh, detected. So tensor decomposition gives you uh, nine degrees of freedom and uh, three independent uh, views so that you can analyze the problem without making any assumption, without uh, uh, making any uh, uh, underlying uh, precondition about the nature of the motion artifacts themselves. So in conclusion, we considered different types of uh, techniques to remove motion artifacts, uh, independent component analysis, uh, adaptive filters, uh, singular value decomposition and tensor uh, decomposition. The first two are statistical based or probabilistic based and they make a specific assumption as to the distribution of the uh, motion artifact as well as the correlation between the motion artifact and the mo motion sensors. The last two, they don't make any assumption, but they are uh, computation uh, intensive. Uh, but the last one, the, the tensor decomposition is the most uh, promising among all the others. By this, I come to the conclusion of my talk. If you are interested, we have published uh, several papers on this aspect. You can take a look at them. Thank you so much and uh, goodbye from me.